Ascension Sunday. And as we read the Gospel reading today, we celebrate this day. But what is Ascension Sunday? Where did it start? What does it mean? Well, as with everything else, it means different things to different people. Suddenly Ray Connison has just popped into my head. I wanted to look up all the different ways that Ascension Sunday might be celebrated or what it might mean. And this is one of the earliest Christian festivals dating back to the year 68. According to the New Testament in the Bible, Jesus Christ met several times with his disciples during the 40 days after his resurrection to instruct them on how to carry out his teachings. It is believed that on the 40th day, or tradition holds that it is on the 40th day, that he took them to the Mount of Olives where they watched him ascend into heaven. But this also marks the end of the Easter season and occurs 10 days before Pentecost. So really what it marks is this in-between time. Depending on the phases of the moon in a particular year, Ascension Day is celebra it's usually celebrated on a Thursday. That's the actual day. However, churches, especially here in the United States, celebrate it on the following Sunday because nobody leaves work for any holy day anymore except for maybe Christmas. Many Eastern Orthodox churches also calculate the date of Easter according to the Julian calendar and rather than the Gregorian calendar. And so they will celebrate Ascension uh, like a week and a half, two weeks later than we do. Ascension Day is celebrate, celebrations include processions symbolizing Christ's entry into heaven and in some countries chasing a devil through the streets and dunking it in a pond or bar burning it up in effigy to celebrate the Messiah's triumph over the devil. In England, eggs laid on Ascension Day were said to have never go bad and guarantee good luck for a household and if placed in the roof. In Devon, it was ancient belief that the clouds always formed into a familiar Christian image of the Lamb on Ascension Day. As the weather was sunny, the summer would be long and hot, and if it rains, crops would go badly and livestock would suffer disease. According to Welsh's superstition, it's unlucky to work on Ascension Day. I'm going with that one. <laughs> in Portugal, Ascension Day is associated with wishes for peace and prosperity, and traditionally, in rural communities, people make bouquets from olive branches and sheaves of wheat with poppies and daisies. The olive and the wheat are symbolic of abundant harvest, and the poppy stands for peace and the daisy for money. And wheat is kept in the house throughout the coming year as a symbol of prosperity. Also, it's practical since they have to bake bread. <laughs> for many of us, we have an image or have been taught with this image of Christ rising through the crowds where he's crowned the king of heaven. Martha Spong shares a story of a problem that she ran into with this image. And I'll be quoting her directly as she's telling the story from her perspective. Who is that? She asked, looking up at the stained glass window. My 11-year-old daughter and I were standing in the sanctuary of a church. I had just come to serve. Over the altar hung a white robe, Jesus with his feet on top of the earth, an orb and a scepter in his hand and a crown on his head. It's Jesus, I answered. Really? Yes, I thought a moment. And It's Jesus after he ascends into heaven. So he's a king. She continued struggling with this image. And she went on to say, but... In the windows in our other church, he was holding a lamb in his arms and sitting with the children all around him. She knew Jesus in a particular way. Her Jesus prayed in the wilderness for 40 days, got some fishermen to be his disciples by telling them to cast their nets on the other side of the boat. Jesus told stories of runaway sons and lost coins and made sure the children got to talk to him even though the disciples tried to keep them away. The, de the disciples knew the same Jesus. He drove unclean spirits out of the suffering. He fed thousands of people with only five loaves and two fish. He straightened back up a woman bent over for 18 years. He had flesh on his bones and back strong enough to carry his own cross to the hill where the soldiers were to crucify him. They knew the Jesus who lived and breathed and touched them in gestures of healing and love. Her daughter goes on to say, I miss the Jesus from our other church. And so did the disciples. They couldn't see yet 
what later generations would make of him, clothing him in stained glass regalia. They could only stand and watch him go. In today's Gospels, there's nothing of exotic rituals. There is no talk about what is the plan. We know the disciples stayed in Jerusalem and worshipped in the temple. We are told the disciples' minds were opened so they understood all that was said of Jesus in the scriptures, and it was all made clear. This understanding is kind of important. Remember, throughout the stories of the Gospels, time and again, Jesus is trying to explain things to show the truth to the disciples, but they just don't get it. At least, not all of it anyway. I mean, they may get glimpses or pieces or say something that is true and yet do not completely understand its meaning. So Jesus opens their minds. Now, this is beyond simple comprehension. Jesus opens their minds so that they can see fully and clearly in a way that none of us can, in a way that scholars and theologians are still trying to discern, learn, and figure out all of that Christ's teachings imply and how they can be applied to our daily lives. But I can't help but wonder about this confusing in-between time. We learn of Jesus' death and resurrection three days later. There was no time for grieving process because Jesus appeared and says, look, I'm dead, but not really, for I'm glorified and resurrected. I'm sorry, but for us mere humans, this would seem, at least to me, to be a very confusing time. You're dead, but you're not really dead. You're here today, you're gone tomorrow, you're back again. Many unclear goodbyes in everyday family life is also fall outside of traditional categories of loss and nonetheless cause distress. Jesus' death and resurrection puts Jesus on an outside category. Nobody's quite sure how to deal with it. Their emotions are probably running amok in spite of clear understanding. Can you just imagine what the disciples must have been going through, believing Jesus was dead, Witnessing his horrific death, then hearing his body is gone, and then seeing him. Now, Jesus actually appears ten times in different accounts over a 40-day period. I can only imagine that this might have left more questions than answers, and knowing how we grieve as humans, this must have left many happy and yet sad and wanting to mourn, yet not sure they should. Perhaps they should mourn and rejoice at the same time kind of feeling going on. I mean, we can relate to this simple confusion of emotions. I mean, we've all experienced something like maybe a good friend moved for a better job or for love. We're happy for their lives being better, but sad and mourn the loss of them being nearby. Or perhaps we recall someone we knew who was truly suffering from illness. We are glad that they're feeling no more pain and that they're in a glorious joy heaven that we believe in. And yet, we still mourn their loss even though in our hearts we know they're whole again. So this is the confusing, ambiguous state we find the disciples in when they're happy to be in Christ's presence for this final time. Now Jesus could have just said goodbye and left them for good, leaving them to their own devices and manners of coping. But he decided to give them this great gift, this gift of complete comprehension. This new comprehension must have been overwhelming and so everything in the Old Testament that points to Jesus, the Messiah, to God, can now be understood in its entirety by these disciples. That is everything from Genesis to the Maccabees. That is all the funky laws, the deeply coded Psalms. It must have been amazing and exciting. Suddenly they had no need to grieve or fear. They now have more than faith. They have more than faith. They have complete and total comprehension. All that was leading up to Jesus' birth and ministry, all that he had been teaching and everything that he had taught about himself, they now understood it all. They knew what this conquering of death meant. They knew this is a gift and not often given, for this is beyond faith. They no longer have any need to grieve Jesus' death, or actually, death at all. They knew all that had happened and understood why it had to happen in such a way. They knew what Jewish scholars and sects had been arguing over for years. They understood each and every reference to Christ and how it was meant to be applied. Then they were told they must proclaim forgiveness in Jesus' name, starting with Jerusalem and then everywhere else. 
Then they were told that they must stay in Jerusalem until, until you've been furnished with heavenly power. Until you've been clothed with power from on high. Until, wait a minute, what? Jesus' final recorded words in Luke are kind of really no surprise. Though I kind of think, you know, here you are, you gave these guys all the knowledge they needed. Why do they need to sit around and wait? We often see Jesus give orders that require a blind trust. Go to the village, you'll find a coat, tell the owner the master needs it. Okay, I'll go get it and hope I don't get arrested or clobbered. Uh, take this pitcher of water and pour it for the master of the feast. Okay, I hope he doesn't think I'm insane. Go wash your eyes in the river and you will see. Stand up and walk. Jesus' stories are full of bold statements, and his followers and the people he encountered do what he says. He had that kind of charisma. So after you've been following this guy around for three years, you have seen all that he has done, you've been a part of this fantastic life for three years, and he tells you to just hang around the city, you kind of do it. <laughs> you go to the temple praising God for all that you have seen and all that you now understand and know. The world you had known three years ago is gone. There is no going back to that way of thinking or that way of life anymore. You hang around the city waiting for what's next. They may have had no issue with this as to what comes next. They may have already understood part of it due to this divine comprehension. Though, technically, there is nothing written about this gift of power, this gift of the spirit that is about to come. So I will take the bold step and say they're hanging around the city because Jesus said, hang around the city. What is next? What's going to happen now? Well, I can tell you what isn't happening. There is no vision of a white-robed king hovering over the earth judging us all. The disciples weren't taught that. There's no vision of toppling over Rome. Jesus himself squashed that vision. This is a time of in-between, these few days. This is a time of change and opportunity. You see, while the disciples waited for what was next, they continued to do what they knew. And isn't that the best thing to do in a time of crisis or in the midst of transition or in the midst of change? The best advice given in the midst of, midst of radical change is not to do anything but to wait, to pray, to weigh things carefully. Don't get anxious. Don't make rash decisions. Again, today's reading is what we call the Great Commission. And it is found in all the Gospels. It's an emphatic call from Jesus to the church that would be created by the apostles and that the Gospel is to be preached among all the nations and salvation to all who will receive it. This is the call that later becomes communities of love and support, the model of early church where Yes, they shared the Christ story, but more important, they practiced the Christ story. This apostles had this gift of complete and full knowledge during this in-between time, and they did what they needed to do. They attended temple. They prayed and cared for each other and the community around them that had been touched by Christ. They probably reminisced and shared stories. Maybe they shared what they now understood amongst themselves and perhaps a few others that said they were preaching. They had time to process for all, all this time until the day they were all gathered again in a room and things would once again change once more, which we'll hear more about next week. Now, I may be repeating myself, but to have suddenly been gifted with all this understanding of scripture, it's still, I can't rationalize it, it's a staggering thought. It had to be a rush. If you've ever seen Matrix, I always imagine it kind of like Neo hooked up to a computer and suddenly he just zaps, they zap him with a few lessons, he pops his eyes open, <laughs> I know Kung Fu. <laughs> of course, then Mophius says, show me, and that doesn't go too well. <laughs> so you need some time to practice what you've learned and what this knowledge you gained and process this through. Again, a reason for the time between the commissioning and the gifts of the Spirit. To know something is one thing and actually apply it and speak it and give it as a teaching as completely another. The apostles had all this knowledge, but they needed time to figure out how to apply it, how they were going to use it, and where they were going to go. But they didn't get caught up on where they were going to go. 
the apostles, we are told, were moved after they received that spirit and do what they must do day to day, and that is to live the model that Christ taught them. So what happened to them? Well, Andrew was a missionary to modern-day Georgia and Bulgaria. He was martyred and crucified in the town of Achaia. If he had worried about that, he would never have gone out. Bartholomew became a mission to India. He was martyred and crucified upside down in modern-day Georgia. James, son of Alphaeus, local missionary to Jerusalem, martyred and stoned in Jerusalem and was buried there beside the temple. James, son of Zebedee, was, stayed local in Judea, and he was martyred and beheaded. John, the brothers of James, was banished to Patmos and died of old age. Well, there's one good story. Matthew was a missionary to Iran area, and he died of old age. Simon, Peter, was a missionary to Galatia and Pontus and Cappadocia, Italy, Asia, and he ended up in Rome where he was hung upside down in the Grand Circus. Philip went to Turkey where he was martyred and crucified upside down. Simon the Zealot, the Bishop of Jerusalem, after James, died of old age. Deodius, also known as Judas, son of James, who has, became a missionary to Edessa into the Mesopotamia area, you know, which is Iraq, Syria, Turkey. And he died of old age. Thomas, often remembered as Doubting Thomas, preached to the Iran, to different tribes there, the Parthians, the Medes, the Persians. He was killed and buried in Calamine, a city in India. Matthias became a local missionary in Jerusalem and died of old age. And then, of course, there's Paul, who was martyred and beheaded in Rome. They all did what they had to do. They were all empowered to teach and preach. If they worried about what was going to happen, because they already knew what happened to Jesus, if they worried about tomorrow, I predict none of this would ever happen and we wouldn't be standing here today. Then this... Often we fear change. In the midst of it, we make rash decisions. But through the fate of the disciples, though the fate of the disciples is hard, they made their choices with clear heads and full hearts because they took the time to live into the present of that in-between time. And I just pray, as we are going through church change and we're going through growing pains and friends are moving and people aren't feeling well, May we have the grace to do the same as we grow and live into who we are called to be as a church and as individuals. May we have the grace to be in the moment, to be thankful and connected to God in this day and in this moment and in every day. Amen.